Welcome to Beyond the Reiki Gateway with Reiki Masters Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you through donations. Links to help support our all-volunteer effort are in the show notes and also on our website, beyondthereikigateway.com. And now it is time to begin our journey together beyond the Reiki Gateway. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Reiki Gateway. I'm Kathleen Johnson, here with my co-host, Andrea Kennedy, and we have another really special guest with us today. Bud McGargy is a former senior behavioral healthcare executive, a Washington, D.C. healthcare lobbyist, and an independently published award-winning author of five unconventional spiritual memoirs. The latest in Bud's series is titled Soul Afterlife, Beyond the Near-Death Experience. And when I say unconventional, I mean unconventional. Bud has a fascinating story to tell us, some fascinating revelations he received, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. So Bud, what were you thinking about in terms of the afterlife before coming on to visit us today. You know, Kathleen, I want to thank both you and Andrea. Thank you for having me today. I, I appreciate spending some time with you. I'm asked that question often because of the, and I think your listeners will get this over time, the unconventionalness of the context of this book. But what I was thinking about was where is the line between what is real and what is imagined or eccentric? That's where my mind was right prior to us going live. It seems like that would be a fairly simple question to answer. You know, if I can see it and hear it and, uh, and, and touch it, then that must be real, right? But what if, uh, if I have exclusively that point of view of the world? Have I limited myself from seeing what may exist beyond the obvious? Am I unable to see things with new, a new set of eyes? I would like to think, and this is what I was thinking prior to us getting together, I would like to think that this ongoing story of the universe is a tale about our, all of our human imaginations, like sort of like a romanticized narrative with the capacity to take seriously everything that we see before us might not be all that we understand. And I think that becomes really the backdrop, the philosophical backdrop, I guess, of how this book came to be. That, uh, because when you, when you get into the world trying to understand spirit and the world of souls and the energy of souls. It's as though you have become almost an anthropologist of sorts, you know? And so who are these anthropologists? They are the curious ones among us. They're the ones that are tenacious, meddlesome in some respects, intense, all looking to try to answer a question for themselves. What is it like to have lived in that world? They are examining the most primitive of all questions. What is it like to walk in those shoes? So that's kind of the backdrop of how I start to examine the world of an afterlife. It's not that I think that I am a spiritual anthropologist of sorts. My journey in terms of trying to understand this was really a matter of trying to understand what did we really mean by the spirit of man or the spirit of a woman. I never really seriously entertained writing about any of this. I tell people, my friends, anyway, my family, I was trying to examine some personal issues when, in fact, I was really trying to resolve some spiritual-related issues that were of a professional nature. Having operated psychiatric hospitals my entire life, I was really trying to understand what do we really mean by the spirit of an individual? Or we eventually kind of led down a road of, of discussing, are we a soul? Do we have a soul? And what makes up that soul, if anything? And that's why I think it's interesting that I joined the two of you today, because if we do have a soul, my belief is, is it made, it's made of energy. You guys work and deal with the hand, you put your hands on energy. I spent some time at a uh, monastery, a Watt in Northern Virginia, along with my daughter, trying to examine from a psychological standpoint, what other kinds of things can we do in the behavioral healthcare industry that would help someone begin to more thoroughly examine that aspect of them, the, the spirit part of them, the soul part of them. And, you know, Buddhists have a way of taking us down that path. They have a contemplative therapy, which is kind of examines that meditation, relaxation, acupuncture. There's a wide variety of things to kind of get into a realm of alternative medicines. But they have a philosophy, uh, especially the Theravada Buddhists, they have a philosophy called anatman. 
And that one is radically different from my Roman Catholic upbringing because my background there was that, you know, I have a singular soul. I leave this planet. I go to an environment. And based upon that my good deeds or bad deeds, that environment changes when I leave. Anatman was different. Anatman troubled me because it said in, in basic theory, you are energy, but when you pass, you go into a large, my Buddhist friends don't yell at me because I'll do a simple explanation of it. You go into a big ocean of energy and you meld with that energy and that energy comes back, but it doesn't come back as Kathleen Johnson or Andrea Kennedy or Bud McGorgy as we know it. It comes back as a different kind of ball of energy for lack of better terms. And it troubled me and I didn't have a... Uh, a lot of success kind of working my way through that debate in my head. I have a very dear friend, uh, Kenshin, who's the abbot at the monastery. And I had a lot of questions. And I think I irritated Kenshin to the point where he was, was glad when I eventually left. But he said to me, you know, he said, sometimes you have so many questions. Sometimes some of the answers of these kind of life questions come when you have to have unique or peculiar resources available to you. And either but you will find yeah, those resources or perhaps those resources will find you. Well, I ended up in not far from you, Kathleen, in Berwick, Pennsylvania, talking to a resource there who had access to voice channeling with a, let's call a, a, a guide that took me on this 10-year journey of understanding what is it like to have an expedition into the world of souls. In regards to the path you take there, eventually you're led to what is the afterlife really like? And is it as we learned in Catholic grade school that it looks like this? Or is it something different? We can examine afterlife any one of a number of ways. You know, Andrea, your family has a little bit of a medical background. There's a medical examination of the afterlife. You and I may not like what they have to say, but they have an opinion about it. There is any one of a number of religious dogmas, including my Roman Catholic dogma, about what it may be or what it may not be. We can Google any one of a number of literary you know, professionals about their opinions, writers, uh, not so much like myself, but uh, Michael Newton was a famous author of mine who wrote Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls. Loved his work. It's very organized, very safe, protected. It stabilized me in terms of my examination of the other line. We can look at the academics, the philosophers. Robert Lawrence Kuhn has a YouTube series where he examines along with any one of a number of people about human consciousness, afterlife, souls, etc. Uh, there's a metaphysical kind of the world I stepped into up in Berwick. And then there's the world of NDEs. I did a lot of research on NDEs throughout these 10 years. And what led me to an alternative look at that was that I had a, an enormous amount of respect and courage for the people who were articulating their NDE experiences. But as much as there was a similarity, there were also vast differences in terms of what happened to them. I never had an NDE, but as a clinician, I had the opportunity, it's in the book, to sit with somebody right after they had had their NDE. Although I didn't remember it in my frontal lobe consciousness, when I began to take a look at the afterlife world, all of a sudden that resurfaced in me. I said, yeah, that's right. I had this experience with Whitney, you know, 25 years ago. And it looked similar to what I was learning in terms of NDEs. So regardless of whatever path you want to choose in terms of examining it, as I tell people oftentimes, in the end, it doesn't matter because all of it is a leap of faith in terms of what road you want to travel in terms of understanding it. And the road travel that seems the most comfortable for people is the one that makes them feel more secure about what their core beliefs are. But that's not to say that in terms of our understanding, what may be real may be beyond what we see that's the obvious. And as I've learned in terms, and it's in the context of this book, and I don't think the book's hard to get through. I think it's challenging to get through because it will challenge often and did with me, challenge many of my core beliefs. But it seemed to me that if I could have the ability of suspending my ego momentarily in terms of protecting what I am, I may be open to an awareness that may end up assisting me in an afterlife more than prohibiting me and my movement in an afterlife. So that's what I was thinking about getting ready to talk with the two of you today. We can certainly talk about a wide variety of issues within the books. And I know Kathleen and Andre, you guys have maybe specific areas you want to kind of address. So I'm open to whatever path you would like to travel with me today. I'm really curious, but I think a lot of our listeners have a lot of the same questions, maybe things we hear about just going through life. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about religious beliefs or metaphysical or any of those sort of categories. I think people in general hear about these near-death experiences and people describe a tunnel. What can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. As a therapist, I was sitting alongside of a, a patient who had just had a near-death experience in a hospital. And in the course of his sharing with me what his experience was, he mentions to me the rapidity, vastness, comprehensiveness of what he was experiencing all at once. He went on at length about it. And he said, for example, I could hear and see everything all at once, but it all made sense. But what was odd was that it was as I was passing through what he described as a cloth-like tunnel while all this was happening. So there were like multiple things happening all at once. So that was my first exposure to what, as you would say, Andrea, the, the, the tunnel. Your listeners may understand if they choose to read the book. The book's written in a narrative kind of format. I'm asking questions and this guy is giving me answers. And I ask him at one point, what is the tunnel? Because so many people that have NDEs refer to the tunnel. And he says, well, the tunnel is not a doorway. It's not a passageway. It's not an entry into some other place. He says, the tunnel is your aura spinning at the level of the frequency and vibration you had during the life. The higher the vibration, the faster the tunnel. Oh, wow. And I said to him, well, I said, why did the one person that I had an experience with call it a cloth-like tunnel? This is where it gets in that world of what do you want to believe kind of thing. I never shared anything about this individual to this guide. He said, the patient you were sitting with was a drug addict. He says, what that does to your aura, it creates holes within the context of your aura. So it would make sense that it would appear cloth-like, that it wasn't a solid kind of thing. And he said that based upon the activities of your life during the course of this incarnation, that will dictate your vibration and your frequency when you pass. And in terms of the afterlife voyage, so to speak, the higher the vibration, the faster the voyage is. Mm -hmm. And the more and the quicker you get to the end of that so that you can begin to examine other kind of options as a soul. Does that make sense? I think it does. That's really fascinating because I know with working with energy, I have seen the holes in the aura before. And I've heard other people describe that as well. The other thing, though, is I wondered about what you just said. So there's the tunnel, and then you alluded to, and then. And so so that's my question. What then? Uh, complex. Okay. Um, All right. And complex. First, I would think that anybody who reads this book will face a series of challenges. Because I think it, it, it is, as Kathleen was telling me earlier, it's, it, it's unconventional, to say the least. The first part that challenged me was that it was suggested to me that when we pass our energy splinters like a diamond, it doesn't stay intact. You know, much like my Buddhist friends would say, you go into the ocean of energy. But he was saying, you don't lose your identity within that. You just, you just splinter. And as you splinter, you start to have a series of experiences that are required to what you and I may say is a review, right? A life review, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's explained in much more finer detail than that. And at certain aspects, let me give you an example, because mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know what I think most of your listeners would want to know. When I die, am I going to experience what I think I'm going to experience? And he says, of course you will, because that's your primary memory. Mm. And he says, the question would be, does energy have a memory? Well, if a flower is comprised of energy and a flower knows to come back as a flower every year, is that a representation of a memory of sorts? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But if the primary memories are that of love, which is the first real <clears throat> sense that he describes that the soul experiences then it is no wonder that people that even on near-death experiences, the things they experience are, I'm with my loved ones, I see my loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. The soul's primary energy is circling around the love that it experienced when it was here. Now, after that, it may get a little bit more complex. It may start to experience things about how did the soul feel about creation? How about the things that it believed in over the course of time? So what they experience is, he says to me emphatically, but you're a Buddhist. If you believe that you die and you walk hand in hand with Buddha, that's what you do. 
If you believe in God and Jesus in a certain format, that's what you will do. He says, but it becomes more complex. Suppose for a minute, bud, that your idea of heaven is you're walking along the beach with your loved ones, the beautiful air, you can smell the sea breeze. It's just the perfect day. How long until that becomes an unperfect day? He says, so what happens, he says, is that the young souls that he describes, I'll get into this a little bit later because I know Kathleen wants to talk about the octopus, but he says a young soul may have had many lifetimes as a young soul, but its view of the world may be, in the afterlife world, may be very limited in terms of what its vibration is and so what it experiences. It doesn't know that it needs to move on yet to the next one. And I asked him, I said, well, if you're going to have a progression as a soul, what three things would you and I need to know now to have it move in a progression? And I found his answers very interesting and enlightening. And we can talk about him and my relationship to him in a little bit later. But he says to me, the first thing is a solid form of self-esteem that you know who you are. If you know who you are, then you're more open to awareness. He said, the second thing that you would need is to have a mentor of some sorts, someone who can teach you that there are other things to be aware of than what you currently are kind of captured up in. And he said, the third thing is you need a healer. Because when people are attached to healers, they're more likely to open up in terms of, and you guys should know this more than anybody, they're more likely to open up to kind of things that they can be receptive to. But he said healers come in many forms. Healers can be a person. It could be something you read. It can be an animal. But you have to have those three things in order to understand that there may be some level of movement that's required on your soul's part to kind of move on in terms of its own evolution. I just love what you just said right there, Bud, and the quantifiable three things. It gives me a lot to think about, and so I appreciate that. I wanted to sort of take one little quick step back. You talked about the person's experience will sort of dictate the experience on the other side, if I heard that correctly. And so love, they'll experience love, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I want to take a little bit of a detour and say, what if there is a strong belief in judgment and heaven and hell? Can you speak on that? Oh, you could have asked me an easier question, Andrea. Sorry. But, uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I tell a story in the book because I have that question, the one you just asked me. I have that question in my head prior to going to a session where I know I'm going to talk about it. And I immediately called my Buddhist friend, Kenshin, and I said, can you please, can we talk? I need to have some understanding of what I'm getting involved in. And so I tell the story. I go to the monastery. It's very early in the morning. The only time I can see Kenshin is 4 o'clock in the morning. So you can imagine what that kind of condition I'm in when I go to see him. But he says to me, I find it interesting, but that you always come here, just paraphrase, you always come here to find the answers you already know. But let's talk about that. He says, let's, do you want to learn about you know, heaven and hell? He says, uh, if you don't mind, can I read you a story? And he pulls out a piece of paper. I don't remember it in entirely detail, but the story goes something like this. The samurai warrior goes into the village to talk to the abbot monk. And he says, I'd like to learn about heaven and hell. And the monk looks up at him and said, why would I want to talk with you? You're nothing but a disgusting worm. You have nothing to give me. Get out of my sight. I hate you. I'm not going to say anything to you. And with that, the samurai raises his sword in an attempt to take off the master's head. The monk looks up and looks him in the eye and says, that's hell. And with that, the samurai drops his sword, covers his eyes with his hands, falls to his knees, and says, Master, I'm so sorry. The anger and the hatred got the hold of me. He says, can you forgive me? And he says, and that's heaven. The Buddhist philosophy about all that is this, that heaven and hell are with us always, both in this life and the next. In the next, it's not a place you go to, and this is what I've been told. It's not a place you go to suffer. You are your own judge of every action, thought, belief, energy you had while you were living, and you will judge that, and you will be judged by that. 
and you will be judged in a, in a way, as I'm told anyway, as an example, if you beat somebody up in the schoolyard, you will revisit that in a way to try to get an understanding of that incarnation and what you learned or didn't learn. Because you learn from both sides. You learn from the yin and yang of life. So you'll experience the punches you felt. You also understand the thoughts that were behind all that that the person had about you while that was occurring. So if that is a way of perceiving a hell, then yeah, that's part of the judgment. But you are the judge. You are not judged by somebody else. Does that make sense, Andrea? Yes, but thank you. But I read that story in the book, and it really grabbed me. I I was floored by that. And I thought it was such a beautiful parable about the nature of heaven and hell. And like you, I was raised Roman Catholic. So my early teachings, and actually all through high school, because I had 13 years of Catholic school, were that heaven and hell were places and how you lived your life. And if you committed venial or mortal sins, you know, too bad for you, that kind of philosophy, it was frightening. The Catholic Church instilled a lot of fear and guilt into me over the years, but I've been able to unpack a lot of that and unravel it and come to my own conclusions. Yeah. <laughs> and what you described earlier about what you've learned about souls and where they go and what happens, oddly enough, it does coincide with a lot of what I've learned over the years as well. It's not that far afield. So that's encouraging because, as you said, your book is unconventional and you bring forth a lot of things that I think most people never considered when considering what happens when we die. But I do think one of the main concepts in your book, Soul Afterlife, is the concept of the octopus analogy. And You know I've been wanting to get to this now. (laughs) It was interesting, yes. I found it rather puzzling and a little bit hard to understand. So I'm hoping that you can touch upon this and perhaps condense it into an easily understandable description for our listeners and also for me. Yeah, good question. Probably the number one question I get and a number one area of interest because of the way it presents itself. I think in its simplest form, it's a way of demonstrating through analogy because analogies are stories. You know, it's just a way of telling a story. It's a way of understanding, do we have multiple lives? Do we live multiple lives? And if we do, how can I make sense of that in any kind of form or fashion? It's also a way of attempting to articulate what reincarnation may be, the purposefulness of why we exist. Now, as I told both of you earlier, this has been a 10-year voyage for me. I was introduced to the octopus analogy. I'm going to try to get the date right, probably in 17, I guess. We are writing Soul Mechanics, Unlocking the Human Warrior. That's where it was first introduced to me. Over the course of those years, I have been given little nuggets to try to understand better its complex nature, including even more since I've written Soul Afterlife. But it's a way of showing how a soul, in fact, evolves in terms of its learning what some of the trappings may be as it tries to learn through different things. Let me give you an example without getting too complex here. Is it possible? And this is, this is actually brought up specifically to me in the book. And Laz says to me, let me back up for a minute. He asked me many years ago, describe in one word what you think your purpose is right now. Now I would ask both of you, can you do that? I'm not looking for an answer. I had no answer because it was just something I don't think about. And he said to me, you're a healer. He said, now, in this incarnation version, bud, your healing isn't so much laying hands on people anymore. That's my term, by the way. He says, your healing is to try to construct the environments in which people heal to be better for them. That's why you run hospital. He said, now, in terms of the octopus analogy and multiple lives, Is it possible in order to learn everything there is, both the yin and the yang of a healer, that you needed to be both the doctor and the patient at times to really understand it? Well, that only begins to make sense to me if I can think in terms of an octopus analogy where my energy in this, I don't want to go too far with this company, but the totality of my energy is in the head of the octopus. 
along with several mates that are, quote, my learning mates, your real soulmates, not your romantic soulmates, your real soulmates. And my incarnations are octopus tentacles that I drop from that head. And maybe one of the incarnations, I am a doctor. Maybe in another one, I'm a patient. Maybe another one, I'm running hospitals. I'm learning all there is, both the good and bad. Maybe in one of the incarnations where I was running hospitals, I was terrible at it. Maybe I destroyed the hospitals. You know, Maybe I was the worst patient. Maybe I was the best patient. How do you learn everything there is about that one experience that you as a soul decided would be your focus until you completed everything there was to learn about that goal. Equally, he says in the analogy, you're formed into, he calls them energy learning groups. They are other souls, he says, four, five, six of them, all with basically the same kind of vibration and, and frequency, give or take, different personalities, but their intent is the same thing. So he would say, but you have four or five other energies in the head of the octopus with you intact their own energies they are also learning about being a healer in their own way through their own appendages droppings so i know that I, I may be getting too far into it kathleen but that's set up that way to kind of give an understanding i guess of what does it take for us if the purpose is to learn everything and some people believe that some people don't but if the purpose is to learn everything the analogy presents a picture by which you can begin to see, oh, this is how it may have to happen in order for me to learn everything. In the book, if you got this far in the book, he describes octopus analogies as if it were a university, he says. And each college in the university is a learning that you have got to go through. He talks about doors. You've got to walk through all these doors. And so each of these you have to do in terms of being a completed soul energy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the octopus analogy, I actually understand most of what you said right there. I do have a question and actually a couple. You say that more than one soul occupies the head of any given octopus, correct? That is your soulmate group, your soul group, your soul pod, your soul family, no matter what we call it. We call it different things in the metaphysical world. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then you also refer to soul learning groups. Are those learning groups outside the octopus head? Is this in another quote unquote location or is it still part of this octopus head? No, that is your learning group. That is your learning group. Okay. I wasn't sure. He talks about it early in the book, how they come together. You know, you come together and because your frequencies and vibrations are very similar and then your interest mm -hmm. is very similar. One way he described the analogy to me was this. He asked me to hold up my hand upside down. And if your listeners could do that real quickly, you know, and each of those fingers is one of the appendages of the octopus, right? And he said, so there's, he says, imagine the power of that, right? He says, now, if you took that and you made a fist, all that energy returns to the head of the octopus. Imagine the power you have as a complete energy, because what you've done is by dropping the energy, the appendages you've released amounts of your energy into incarnations, right? but you still have retained a small portion of your energy back in the head of the octopus. That was fascinating to me because I'm still, I'm not struggling with it. I'm saying, well, this is very odd. It's out there. And because I'm dealing with my guy, he's my guy. He, over the course of 10 years, he shares pieces that are not in the book about some of the other appendages. Let me give you an example. I will share this one with you. It was about eight years ago. This is 2022. About eight years ago, I joined a monastery in Northern Virginia. My interest had changed in a dramatic fashion from moving away from for-profit mental health hospitalization industries to what are these alternative lifestyle kind of things that can be done. And so one night, uh, we're having this discussion about the octopus analogy, and I'm questioning, much like you, Kathleen, I'm having a hard time understanding this. How can my energy possibly be splitting? Who the hell am I if I'm not this? What am I? If all that energy comes back in the head of the octopus, what's that all about? Am I only a small portion of what I actually am? And he says to me, but did you find it interesting that back in this date, 
you joined the monastery in Northern Virginia. I said, well, my daughter was there. I mean, he says, no, that's not it at all. He said, you had an appendage that was a monk in Peru that had passed. And when that monk passed, part of his energy passed to you. And that's the energy that drew you. It's like a suction. It drew you to that kind of an interest. So as these little nuggets came into play, it was like, oh, that made sense. Now, whether it's real or not, that depends on what I believe. Oh, but oh, yeah, can that make sense that if this appendage drops, then he says the energy, like when Kathleen Johnson decides this incarnation is done, right? Part of Kathleen Johnson will roll over to some of other appendages, small portions, because you're not an intact energy by his statement. You're fluid, right? Mm -hmm. You're holding onto your desk right now as you do that part of your little piece of your energy, you're entering that desk, right? Right? Mm -hmm. so, but then the larger portion of the Kathleen Johnson energy will go into its afterlife experience. Hmm. Am I getting too far ahead of myself here? <laughs> I just have, I have a question. I think the answer to the question may either help to clarify or further muddy the waters, but <laughs> so using the monk in Peru as an example, yeah. does that mean that the monk in Peru is a part of your group in the octopus head? He is me. He is you. All okay. those appendages are me. He is me. Okay. And that's, that's the, you know, I had a hard time and still do in my ego administering all of this information. And it goes back, it's a very old Buddhist phrase. You're far more than what you think you are. You're just not aware of it. That fit with kind of where he was going with this explanation of the octopus analogy. You're far more than what you are. And that can be ego scary at first, right? Because I'm not me. There's something more than me. The other part of it is, my God, what, you know, I could be something that's amazing. And he says, you are amazing. You just don't realize it yet. He says, you can't believe the Bud McGargy that comes when he becomes whole and all those appendages are done. And he comes back into the octopus. He says, you can't believe who you are. That's simply astonishing. Mind blowing. But that's where it gets into, the, oh boy, this is, is this extreme or is it or too controversial, you know, I don't know. I take the nuggets, and this is what I do. <laughs> I can explain to you very simply what I do. These sessions I have are three or four hours long. They're completely exhausting. I'll get in my car, it's a three hour drive home. And I call a very dear friend of mine. And the first thing she says to me, oh my God, what did he say this time? And I'll say, I don't know, I can't explain it. I need, to, I need to listen to the tape because it just is too complex for me to kind of siphon my mind through it all to kind of understand. A couple of things, Bud. I think we might want to clarify about the guide that you're talking about and the sessions, where the information's coming from. But before we go to that, um, wow, I want to say perspective. That is the word that just keeps coming up for me is perspective. You know, we talk about walking in another person's shoes to gain perspective. We talk about after the death of an incarnation, feeling the life experience from the other person's point of view. You know, like if we throw a punch, feeling it from the other side, all of that perspective, perspective, I think is so important. Then with the octopus, I was sitting here listening to you describe that. And if I understand correctly, we are simultaneously living multiple lives. We aren't contained in one body in this moment necessarily. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And, and the lives can be anywhere. And in any time, I would guess as well. We're not bound by yes. time or space. Yes. As I sit here speaking with you, I could be also incarnated as a, a soldier in an army 500 yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah. And it's all happening at the same time. Yes. And I, I crossed that bridge with him in terms of trying to grab a hold of uh, deja vu. You know, what is deja vu? And part of the answer is what you just said. He also said, when you can imagine that a part of a tentacle has been amputated. Can you imagine that happening? Given everything we've discussed, but can you imagine something like that happening? And what would cause that? And I said, I don't know, a suicide, a drug overdose or something like that. He says, yeah, that, that, they're examples, he said. But much like when you're in human form, 
and you have an amputated leg, you still have the feeling that the leg's there. And he said, and a soul still has the memory of that part of the appendage. And sometimes that appendage kind of regenerates itself, so to speak. He says, and that soul will feel that part that was cut off. And that's what a deja vu is. It's interesting that he used that sea creature as the example. And I asked him that one time, and he tells me little nuggets again about why that is. And he says, isn't it interesting that an octopus can grow an appendage? It can physically change itself into its environment. I said, are you telling me that when I'm in the heavy octopus and I'm completely whole and healed, cleansed, that there isn't anything I can't do, much like the octopus? And he said, that's the reason we use the octopus. He says, it isn't that you don't know, it's that your human experience, there's so many, he calls them landmines, in your human experience that you begin to lose the fact that you think you can actually do it. He says, here's an example of reincarnation. He says, hypothetically, let's say this, that you set in motion that you want to be, I'll use you as an example of, so okay, Andrea, you want to be born into the scientific family they have this kind of a household. This is kind of the environment you'll be going into. This is the experiences you'll have. These are your grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. And this, you have identified, this is my mission. I am going to be a fill in the blank, right? And he says, there's no doubt in your mind, you can do everything you have initially set out that you want to do. He says, but here are the landmines. Every person you just identified, parents, brothers, sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, et cetera, they're all on their mission to do what they want to do. And you are now going to be interacting and having to navigate your mission around theirs. He says, and sometimes we run into people that aren't that friendly, basically. And that becomes a landmine for us. And they are the learnings that we have to navigate in terms of what we will, again, what we experience, we go back into an afterlife to say, did you learn it the right way, the same way? You may say, I'm done with Uncle Harvey or Aunt <laughs> Betty or whatever. I don't want to experience that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> or you may say, you know what? I think in order to really learn it, I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to experience that exact same thing again. But this time I want to do this with Aunt Betty. That's the complexity of it in my mind is it's not like it's a one-off. Like you're here, you have this life and that's it. You're right. It's the difference between space, time and time space. When you're over there, you have access to past, present, and future. I found it fascinating, Kathleen, that part of the book, he says, you know what, bud? He says, I use numbers. He doesn't have any numbers or anything. I say, okay, how many stages are there on an octopus appendage? How many are there stages? He says, many. I said, okay, let me assume that there's seven. Okay, there's seven, bud. Okay, and I'm at a five. So I pass, I'm a good five. I'm back in the head of the octopus. That part of me is back in the head. The other ones are still kind of living over here. But that, that one appendage is back in the head of the octopus. And he says, okay, now, bud, you have choices here. You may want to go back and say, you know what? My best incarnation ever, I was a concert pianist in New York City in the 1920s. And I was a nine. He says, and you're tired of being that five that you, know, that you were. And you can, you can go back and you can be that nine. You can redo that nine. He says, but you won't learn anything more. And you may mess up that nine. But you can do it if that's what you want. Any soul advancement going forward cannot go forward as the nine. You have to go forward as the most recent one you've had, which is the five. Does that make sense to you, Kathleen? Yes, that does make sense. Any future is based upon the last level that you were at. Yes. But you can go back. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions for both of you, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Okay. Do you have any reoccurring dreams? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have a theory about them in your head? Yes, I would say so. Let me tell you why I ask. I have two. And one night, what happens in these sessions, we kind of were on a, on a topic, right? And then I have these questions that I've written before I go about things I've just been thinking about. And I had these questions. I said, I have two reoccurring dreams that have happened to me throughout the course of my life. I said, can we talk about them? And he said, yes. I said, okay. One dream is this. I'm kind of walking out. I'm on this field, like a field of wheat or something like that. And behind me are these trees, a tree line behind me. And I'm walking in this field. I said, I'm just walking. I said, what is that? This kind of freaked me out. 
he said, that's when you and I meet. Every time you come over, we meet there. Oh, wow. I said, okay. I said, okay. I have another one. This other dream, I'm, I'm sitting in mud. There's someone to my right. Uh, there's a lot of water, like mud water. There's a, a, a structure over to my right as well. It's made of rocks and stuff like that. It doesn't go anywhere. That's the dynamic. What's that all about? Laz says to me this, you know, the woman's grave that you visit all the time. He says, that was your incarnation with her. He says, the one you call Marin, that was her. Both of you. That was when the volcano erupted. Way back, he says, that was way back. You're revisiting a past life through a dream. I'll give you one other analogy that I use that I, that I like to use because it made a lot of sense to me with what I do as a profession. He asked me, he said, but you have an interest in trauma, you know, and people that are experiencing trauma. He said, let me explain to you what trauma is because trauma can prevent you from moving on as a soul in the afterlife. It's like your energy gets trapped a little bit here. He says, it's as though your soul is a small circular pocket mirror and you have dropped that mirror onto a cement surface and it is shattered into hundreds of shards of mirror. He says, now what all of you do in your profession is you take that mirror and you glue and tape it back together. And then that is a successful treatment for you. You said, we put the mirror back together. He said, here's your problem with that. When the patient looks at that mirror, what they see is a shard glued together mirror. They don't see the whole mirror. He said, what you're missing in terms of, and this kind of goes into the healing thing, which you guys are involved in. He said, what it misses is that what you need is the ability to forgive and the compassion you need for yourself. That's what makes your mirror whole. He says, you cannot go to somebody else, or as he says, you can't go into that box and ask for forgiveness. Only you can do that. He says, and once you have the ability to do that, in terms of whatever's happened to you, then you can move on and the, and the mirror becomes whole again. I found that fascinating. you know. But these are like the little storylines, because you asked me, Andrea, about, who is Laz, mm -hmm. you know, he's my guy. I, I say in the book, actually, when people ask me about it, oh, but, you know, come on, you've run over, you know, 200 hospitals for Christ's sake, you know, you know, you know what are you, what are you you're talking to a, you're talking to a spirit somewhere. I said, you know what? I said, let me explain to you what it's like. The, the person I talk to does, she doesn't become possessed and that kind of stuff. It's like just having a conversation, but I will tell you this. It's like talking to my brother across the kitchen table at breakfast. That's what it's like. And his responsibility, as I've learned over time, is to keep me on track to stay with my mates in the head of the octopus. And he was very candid 10 years ago. And he says, hey, bud, your spirituality is well off the rails here. I mean, if you don't, basically, if you don't get your act together, you may not stay in this head. You may have to go somewhere else you know, because your energy will be so different. Uh, so that's part of the octopus analogy is he, he's the maintenance man of the head of the octopus. His job is to make sure that all these energies kind of move along the path that they've agreed that they wanted to take. He never tells them what to do, never makes predictions. He just says, you get like little nudges sometimes, you know? It's like the cartoons I used to watch when I was little, about to have a little little devil, <laughs> right. a little angel on your shoulder, you know? Yep. Oh, yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. Do all people then have a Laz? that are guiding them in the head of the octopus, so to speak? Yeah, that's a very good question. Because I asked him at one point in the book, and Kath, I don't know whether you saw this I or did. not, I asked him, I said, your job must be really hard. And he said, the hardest part of my job is trying to convince somebody that I exist. And he says, you're fortunate that Kenshin told you to find a resource that was unusual and you found her. And now I can talk with you. And he says, before, there have been incarnations of Bud McGargy in this life where we have not had these conversations. And can you explain who her is? Charlotte is a, uh, she's a lot of things. She's a, a medium, psychic, oracle, whatever. He uses the term oracle. He says, she is an oracle. And I said, okay, Laz, you know I don't believe in much of this stuff. How does this stuff happen? He says, everybody has some psychic ability. Everybody, he says. Now, whether you want to turn it on or not, he says, for example, bud, you run as fast as you can away from it. <laughs> you don't want to see anything. You don't want to talk anything. You don't, you know, that's you, bud. He says, imagine that it's a, a body of water. 
there are people that can stick their toe in that water and they have some psychic ability. So some people think up to their knees, some people up to their waist. He says, the woman sitting across from you, she's submerged in it. She sees me, she hears me. I use her as a vessel to talk to you. And her vessel allows me to inject a certain amount of my energy to her so that she can articulate exactly. And I say, Charlotte, what's going on with you? She says, but all I can tell you is this. It's like a computer, she says. He says, I'm trying to repeat it as fast as I can to back to you, verbatim. And I have 10 years of tapes to kind of articulate that. That's kind of what, what it's like. But I get asked questions like some, from some readers, you know, uh, is Laz sitting on the couch across from you? Or is, I mean, does he actually show up? Or how does he show up? Let me just be candid with the two of you. When this first happened, and the attraction I had to Charlotte early on was that we both had studied at monasteries. So that was the attraction. One night, we're having this conversation, and she says, oh, my God, bud. She says, you have a guest. I said, what? She says, there's a, a spirit here. I'm going, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's how it starts, right? And over time, I go home that night, and I say, okay, I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to Google, what do you say if a spirit shows up in front of you? <laughs> I mean, I literally did that. And it says, well, ask its name, what's his association with you, et cetera, et cetera. So next time I go back, I'm asking, what's your name? How do I know you, et cetera, et cetera. And it was as though he was um, testing my, not, not, not in a negative way, he was trying to figure out where was my level of spirituality, because that was the level he was going to engage with me. What I learned over time was this, he presents physically to her emotionally, intellectually, and in an articulate way, the same way he did when he incarnated with me many years ago, because he knew I would relate to that. But if he presented some other kind of like formal guide kind of thing, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't relate to it. So that's who he is. But yet the answer to your question is, yes. As a matter of fact, I've learned recently at the end of the book, we have four guides, two good ones, <laughs> now, let me rephrase that. Two positive ones and two that are responsible for us to learn the yang of life. They are not mm-hmm. negative evil. There are responsibilities that we learn the other right. side of life. So, Oh, very interesting. He's like the maintenance man. He's kind of like, I don't know, director. Or I don't know what the hell he is. <laughs> but he's, and we had one incarnation together that he shared with me many, many years ago. And uh, because he said to me, and this is 10 years ago, he says, what do I remind you of? And I said, you remind me of my brother sitting across the kitchen table having breakfast. He says, that's good because that's what we were. Yes. And that recognizability at some level, I would imagine, is the opening. The part that can cut through your skepticism is that resonance from that time before. I would say to you and to Kathleen, being energy people, that's what you feel. You feel the connective exactly. energy there. Mm-hmm. It's it's in, an interesting dynamic. I often tell her that we ought to film this because by the end of four hours, it's like I am on amphetamines. I mean, I'm not worked up. And she is literally collapsing on her chair, just drained from the energy. But it, it brings a, a sense, I'm, I wouldn't say believability. It brings a different kind of connection to it, I mm-hmm. guess. Even having said that, I still leave her house with a degree of skepticism of what I just heard right. because it is so not out there, but it just so, oh man, I don't, I don't know whether I can believe this or not. And I certainly can't tell my friends <laughs> this because these people are going to really think I'm crazy now. You know? So you just go write a book about it for yeah, the whole world. Bunch of books. But, well, <laughs> or six <laughs> of them. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Andrea. And this is a true story. My first book, which is called uh, Dirt, Truth, Music, and Bungee Chords, Conversations with the Souls of God in My Life. Chapter two is titled My First Spiritual Beatdown. <laughs> and what it is about, this is I just I'm very candid. What it is about is this. He suggested that it would be beneficial if I would write about this because I was journaling all the time anyway. I do that as a living. I journal all the time. And he said, you should write about it. I said, okay, I'll, I'll write about it. I wrote a fiction. Because I didn't want people to know mm. that I was having experiences with an oracle and a, and a spirit. Right. So I wrote a fiction, 70,000 words. And I bring it in. I'm, I'm proud as all get out. I bring it into one meeting. Had it all laid out there. I was going to give Charlotte a copy, et cetera. 
And he says to me, why did you do that? And I said, what are you talking about? He told me to write about this. He says, everything you've written tells everybody that I do not exist. He said, and that's as equally as important that people understand that we are here to help and guide people. And you have just killed me. Oh, wow. Wow. I know. And that's so powerful. I said, okay, I know. I said, okay, that's when the writings become quite the opposite, a distinct and it's, and it's verbatim dialogue that I have with him. Amazing. Okay. With all that being said, the question I have is how can you still remain skeptical? I think in the face of everything that you've experienced over the past decade, I don't know. How can you still remain skeptical? I think there's a little bit of it built in. If you put it on a continuum, right, of what I experience, some of the things fit the continuum very easily because it still has a connection to uh, my past, my memories, my religious beliefs. I mean, things fit. It's when it goes beyond that one level, it becomes challenging. Now, that needle has moved for me over the course of 10 years, but there still is a piece of me that is that worries too much about what other people may think about what the experience is because reading it raw, it's, boy, that's out there, but but you're, you are out there. And so there was this, not a professional challenge, but it felt like one at some times until I could really find a way to incorporate it. So that it becomes a belief rather than just something I'm experiencing. And over the course of time, that needle moves further and further and further in terms of what I believe. For example, and I say this in the book, this book in particular, I had a real challenge with the splitting of energy and the, it wasn't the dissolving of Bud McGargy. Rather than looking at it as Bud McGargy is more and bigger and there's a a new and improved version of him somewhere, you know, in terms of his total energy, but that I wasn't what I was. I wanted to be, this is who I am. Isn't this who I am? And they say, well, yeah, but, you know, there's other pieces to all this. It's kind of making that leap that became a difficult challenge. I say at the end of the book about, a favorite author of mine is Michael Pollan, who wrote How to Change Your Mind. Excellent book. And Michael Pollan was known for food books. He wrote Omnivore's Dilemma, Cooked, a couple other ones. This book, How to Change Your Mind, is about the psilocybin experiments of the 50s, 60s, and 70s that Michael Pollan took part in, along with his wife. And it was about uh, how, under clinical managed conditions, that freed up the ego for them to have a completely different awareness of what everything was. And in a strange analogy fashion, that's kind of where Laz has taken me, is that if you can at least but reduce your ego, you know, the the Buddhists will tell you that an ego is basically a monster who's trying to curtail what you shouldn't believe in. Laz makes the statement, your soul develops once your ego is silenced because that allows for raw awareness about what may really exist. And that goes back to where we started, which is what is real. Is what's real the possibility that because we say, if I can't see it, feel it, and touch it, it it ain't real, right? Mm -hmm. And there's how many people believe that? And does that limit our ability to really see beyond the obvious to the extent that we can see things with a new set of open eyes? I so appreciate that you brought it right back home to where we started, Bud. I think that you have pushed some envelopes here. I think that's a wonderful thing. You have brought forth some real food for thought for our listeners and for myself. And Kathleen, I bet you would agree with that. Oh, yes. I just want to ask you one final question, and that is you have written several books. I believe you've got another one in the works. Is it important for us to start at book one and go through them sequentially? What is your advice for that? That, That's a good question. I think my agent would appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Not me, not so much. I think the books stand on their own, I think, in terms of the topic. I've had friends who have read from book one to book five. All that does is it shows you the evolution of the author. Mm -hmm. That's what it really shows. I mean, as much as I may sound like I know what I'm talking about now, uh, book one, you would say, oh, this guy's having a real hard time with this, you know, <laughs> uh, because I'm learning along the way and my skepticism may appear more severe at the beginning than it does now. So I said early on, the books are about three things. They're about the topic, but they're also about this guy who takes this voyage. That's why I call them unconventional memoirs because I don't know what else to call mm-hmm. it. You know, it's just me having this experience. I get 
some challenges by people because it may be counter to what they believe in. I'm not a smart guy with smart answers, but my response to them is that, that this has just been my experience. That's all it is. I'm just telling you, this is what I'm evolving towards. If you don't agree with me, maybe you ought to write your own book right. you know, about your experience doing it. So it's about the experience. It's about the engagement with this guy, what that environment's like. Because there's two questions I ask all my readers is, you know, if, if you were sitting there, what would you have asked? Would you have asked something different? Right. Well, I mean, I, I can ask you, Andrew, would you have asked something different? I, I don't know. I'm in there at the heat of the moment. He's asking me something. I'm trying to find out. Oh, let me figure out what the answer to this is. Right. Let me give you an example. He tells me one time, but I want you to imagine you have a bee in the palm of your hand, a dangerous, poisonous bee. He says, now smack it. I said, okay, I smack it. He says, what have you done? What have you done? I said, oh, I killed a bee, you know? He says, no, what have you done? I said, have I released its energy? He says, yes. Now it's in the world of energy. It's in the world of bee energy, insect energy. You know, so you learn those kinds of things through through that kind of experience. And the, the third part is that working with a guide, if you had a personal guide that you had access to, I asked, actually I asked him last month, I said, will there ever be a time that I will see you? And he said, do you want to see me? I said, no, I don't want to see you. <laughs> He said, I will come to you when it happens. He says, I will come to you. You will know because I'll be the orb. Hmm. Oh, beautiful. Something to look forward to. Yeah, I, I meditate daily. It would be interesting to kind of go into meditation and have, and to have a conversation. But I'm getting too close to an area where I don't know how I would respond. You know, I, I appreciate the surrogate, to be very honest hmm. with you. It puts a distance. In this book, I write, why on God's earth would I want to walk down the, a dark basement and turn on those lights when Charlotte's more than willing to do it for mm, me. True. You know, then I don't have to deal with, in case there's any monsters down there, <laughs> I don't have to deal with any of that. You know? Well, Bud, on behalf of Kathleen, myself, and the listeners, we certainly thank you for joining us today. It's certainly been thought provoking and we appreciate the conversation. For our listeners, if they want to get in touch with you, could you please share how they might do that? Yes, we have we have a website, budmcgargi.com. They can talk with me at bud at budmcgargi.com. We'll put links in the show notes and invite everyone to dive a little deeper if they're interested in this absolutely fascinating world that you've described, Bud. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Kathleen. I, I appreciate joining you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. We thank you again for joining us. And of course, we invite you to join us next time as we journey beyond the Reiki Gateway with Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy.